So hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today uh, for our lunchtime art talk. Uh, we are so thrilled to be speaking with Adrienne Chadwick and Emmanuel George, uh, two artists that are participating in our current exhibition, Introspective, A Reckoning of the Soul, uh, the show that's curated by uh, Marie Vickles and myself. Uh, the exhibition is on view through February 27th. Um, this conversation in particular is in conjunction with Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week, um, which will feature events and special ex exhibitions all week long. And you can find out more information on their website, ftladw.com, to read about some of the many events and things that they're planning uh, for this week. Um, we also will have something this Saturday, so I just wanted to give um, a heads up. It's a great opportunity to see this exhibition. Um, we're planning this very special event in partnership with uh, NSU Art Museum. It's this Saturday from one to three. It's free, open to all ages. Um, for the workshop, we encourage 18 and over. This workshop is led by artist, choreographer, dancer, activist, educator, and curator, Alonzo Williams. Uh, who will be instructing and in doing his uh, piece in a storytelling demeanor. It includes a dance performance and discussion based on anti-racism and racial reconciliation with interaction with one of the characters um, from his project Thug. After the performance, visitors are invited to participate in an activity that illustrates the importance of racial discourse. Participants will write about their own ethnic and racial identity using paint, graffiti markers, colored thread, and canvases uh, that will create connections with others resembling ideas of reconciliation. Um, in this performance, William comments on the unstable relationship and history of colonization between the United States and Latin America through dance, spoken word, and photography. He speaks to support black and brown communities providing a platform for others to hear their stories to create a movement towards policy changes that affect the community of South Florida. Alonzo is another a local South Florida artist, and so we're, we're thrilled to be working with him in NSU uh, for this weekend's performance. Um, so to go to our incredible uh, participants today, uh, speak a little bit um, about Adrienne Chadwick. She was born uh, in Toronto, Canada for a hot minute, right? Uh, with origins in Belize, Central America and lives and works here in Hollywood, Florida. Her mixed media installations utilize accumulation, repetition and translucence to express ideas related to power and resistance in society and nature. Uh, Chadwick has shown extensively in the South Florida area, including Far Gallery, Fort Lauderdale, African American Research Library and Cultural Center in Fort Lauderdale, the Little Haiti Cultural Complex, Bridge Red Studios, North Miami and Girls Club in Fort Lauderdale. She received a BFA from New World School of Arts and an MPA from Nova Southeastern University. Super interesting. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and then we have Emmanuel George, born um, in Overtown, Florida in 1988. Emmanuel George spent his childhood years in North Miami and Miami Shores before moving to the Hollywood area in 2002. After mentoring under Valencia Gunder, George became an advocate for the local Black community. George's work includes the Black Broward Film Project, uh, Episode 1, A Tale of Sibling Communities, Dania, Dania and Liberia, he is also a producer of the Cis Trunk A Fair, which is the first Black Art Week in Broward County. He has the Emanuel George Collection at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, uh, which is incredible to, to go through. Um, I encourage everyone to, to visit that center and see some of the resources they have there. George has been named a 2021-2022 Encore Gen to Gen Innovation Fellow, an award recognizing pragmatic visionaries in communities around the US. Um, so thank you both so much. Um, we are gonna speak about, you know, one of the things uh, looking at this exhibition, Marie, uh, you know, placed your works uh, together. Uh, just wanted to show a few exhibition views um, in case people have not been to the center. So this is walking in. 
Um, and so as you're approaching this exhibition, you'll see Adrian's piece uh, to the right. And um, with uh, Emmanuel George's four uh, pillars um, on the video monitor just behind it. Um, so Adrian, um, I would love for you to speak a little bit um, about your pieces. Um, what initiated your work in your process? Sure, thanks for having us, Megan. It's been amazing to have this exhibition so close to, to home and feeling like I could just kind of walk down the street to, to see the, the show whenever I want. Um, yeah, so my process, um, I pretty much work a lot in installation and the medium doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and this whole series that we're gonna be talking about today is all made from earthenware clay um, and porcelain clay. And so um, this, this series started quite a long time ago um, with a series that I did with small clay houses. The intention was um, to use Monopoly houses, but it was actually for a class when I was doing my Bachelor of Fine Arts. And that was in the 90s. And so there wasn't um, kind of like an Amazon where you can call and just get something the next day or the next week. I called the game company and they said, absolutely, we can send you, you know, a thousand Monopoly houses. It's going to take four months. And four months in four months, I would have been graduated with my Bachelor of Fine Arts. And so I, this, these actual pieces here are some of those pieces that I ended up making by hand. And the intention was to talk about um, the architectural history in South Florida. We're a linear, geographically linear state and closer to the beach, closer to the east on this side of, of the peninsula and closer to the west on the opposite side. We have small houses, small wooden houses that were made in the 19, early 1900s. Um, of course, before that, we had our indigenous um, cultures that were already here, but um, settlers from the north came and built these houses. And, and every decade or so, new generations of homes were built farther and farther west. Um, innovations happened, like air conditioning didn't exist in the beginning. And at some point, halfway through this, this piece, through the architectural history, houses changed from being one story kind of hurricane resistant homes that had a Florida room and large outdoor spaces so that people can cool off in the hot summers um, with the jealousy windows that allowed, allowed you know, air circulation to being suburban homes that are large under air conditioning space with, no, with not, not large yards. Um, and so that was the beginning of this, just thinking about choices and, and where people choose to live or where they live not by choice. Um, and it's kind of delved into, into housing, you know, over, over the years, over the last, you know, 10 or, or 20 years. And to, to this place right now where I'm really talking only about the housing inequalities that have happened, um, both here in South Florida and across the nation um, through, through in the 19, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, where um, the government and the people in charge, the powers that be uh, enacted um, processes like redlining or um, uh, mortgage kind of allowing certain people to receive mortgages or not receive mortgages. Um, and, and so that affected our neighborhoods and, and where we live by choice or by force. Are there some like uh, personal experiences, you know, maybe not necessarily you, but things that you have seen around you that you think might've taken a, a key into pushing you into this awareness of realizing that all of this stuff was happening around you? Mm -hmm. Well, earlier on in, in this series, when I first made it, what interested me was the fact that I was born in Canada, raised in South Florida, and also a citizen of Belize, Central America, where my mom's family is from and where my mom is from. And I, I realized that in the, in the 90s and 2000s, I lived in Miramar, um, which is close to here, here in Hollywood. And my, my dad, who's an engineer and an architect, he chose to 
move to Broward and to and to buy a home that was like a one story cinder block house from the 1950s um, because he looked at houses in that were kind of getting built up in the West and realized that he didn't think that they were actually strongly built or not appropriate for hurricane season in South Florida and might not withstand, come to find out that yeah. those homes that are in Broward along um, west of university around the kind of Flamingo, those houses were pre, we call them, or they call them pre-Hurricane Andrew homes. And those houses were not built to code. Um, the top, the bottom half of the house, they're two-story houses. The bottom half of the houses are cinder block. And then the top half was just board wood with stucco on top of it. When you look at the windows, a concrete house has a window space that's this big with the window in it. But these houses, pre-Andrew houses, had a space this big with the window in, in it. And um, and I had friends that lived in those houses, so I was aware of that. And, and that... Um, is my experience. Like everybody wanted these suburban houses that looked all the same and they were all painted beige, you know? And I was like, no, we need a orange house or like a lime green house. Like I was used to that aesthetic because of the Caribbean um, aesthetic in Belize. And so I always felt pride, like a sense of pride to have a house that's very different than the neighbor's house that has different trees than the neighbor's house. And so, and so, when everybody's kind of like running in the 90s and 2000s when everybody's running to these suburbs that all look the same I'm like oh no like those are those are not that does not look aesthetically pleasing to me so so that was my personal experience with the beginning of this and then the and then my personal experience with the redlining is something we were talking about before we came on is that my family when they first moved to South Florida tried to buy a house in Miami Lakes and um, I have a biracial mixed family and it didn't work out. And they ended up buying their, their first home when I was uh, a young person um, in Carroll City, which is now Miami Garden. <clears throat> um, it's interesting the way that you talk. So it's like looking at this piece as you're describing it, it it's funny because it's like you look at it and it's at first glance, you know, like what you're saying with Monopoly houses, this kind of homogenized look, but your pieces are all handmade. And so when you get in kind of close to it, you can see, I think we've got a, like a few close-ups. They're all like individually made different, there are little subtle differences in each and every one. And I would love for you to speak because you also, as you were installing, um, you know, it was wonderful. I really got to get to know you because you were coming in and it took you a few days in assembling this piece. So this is a piece, this is an ongoing series where each one is unique, um, each installation is unique. And I would love for you to talk about this piece in particular with the, with the way that you delineated the red lines and, and just the uniqueness in their, in their making. Mm -hmm. So um, at some point I decided that I, I, I had the, I could have made a decision to make these houses with a mold at some point. And I decided to continue the process of making them all individually by hand without measuring them just by eyeballing the size because I wanted to talk a little bit about labor and um, because it was about inequities um, in housing, it was also about working class people who are trying to live and survive and, and buy a home or, or rent a home or live in a safe neighborhood for their families. And so I made that, that choice, that decision to continuously make these all by hand. I also just have a, a like a problem that we won't talk about in this meeting. We'll have another <laughs> <laughs> that I always have a tendency to do things the long way uh, for some reason, uh, kind of like torturous, laborious um, processes. And um, yeah, and I think in the future, I might consider talking more about the prefab nature of, of suburban houses and maybe make a mold and, and do a series with the houses that are not individually handmade. But for the last year or two, this is what they've been and um, all individually handmade. And some of the earlier pieces have a, a different pitch on the roof, but then after making hundreds of them in, in, my, in my studio, um, 
workshop, just hundreds and hundreds of little houses, the pitch, I became, I perfected the pitch to have it, you know, almost all identical in the size. Mm -hmm. And what are you thinking about with the string as you were applying the string? And then also you, people can't really see this, but there's little slips of transparency that look like little geometric shapes mm -hmm. that look like maps, like look like kind of area mm -hmm. maps. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this is only my second time ever using the the red thread to and the and the vellum. This is my first time using the vellum as as uh, geometric shapes that represent um, mapped spaces, but. Um, I thought that it would be important to kind of give a visual symbol to indicate, you know, this is about redlining and this is about gentrification because prior to this piece, I had one that didn't use the red string or the vellum. It did have the white and black um, different colors, the porcelain and the, and the black clay uh, to show the changes in gentrification to, ident to create a symbol representing race um, but adding that red line with thread just really helped people because prior to that people sometimes even don't don't see these as houses they they identify it maybe as tombstones or um, just different structures they don't see them necessarily as houses but then the redlining the symbol of a red line really helps people when they're looking to identify that oh these are homes this is this is about redlining um, and then the vellum, um, I looked before I made this piece, I looked at a lot of redlining maps from around the nation. And also I found a lot from Miami. I didn't find a lot that were digitized from, from Broward, but, um, but I wanted to, I didn't want to kind of represent an actual red line space. I wanted to give the idea of a narrative of a map or of a space that is delineated in some way politically. Um, and for people to come up with their own ideas or think about their connections to it. So it's, it's a very, because it's vellum and it's on a white base, you can't really see it, but how you see it is when the light hits it, it uh, there's a delineation because of the shine or the sheen, the lack of sheen, the, the opacity of the vellum. So some people don't even ever see it, um, yeah. but I'm playing with that and I'm interested in, going forward, you know, for my next, um, the next pieces that I'm working at potentially adding color, you know, and seeing, seeing where that takes me. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I want to look at, at, cause you said you were referencing some of these maps. And so, it, you know, looking at, uh, this really interesting website that was put together, um, by the University of Richmond, Virginia Tech, and University of Maryland. This is the mapping, um, inequality mapping um, in New Deal America. And so, you know, just so people know, this is dsl.richmond.edu, and I can put this on in the comments section afterwards, but you can get an idea of redlining um, all over the United States. And then also this idea of color coding, A for best, B, still desirable, C, definitely declining, and D, hazardous. Um, and so as you, you know, this was something that, you know, Adrian was looking at, um, you know, or some of these maps where you can really get, you can get a show area description, plugging into these different areas, they're color-coded, um, as I had mentioned with the red as uh, declining, and then you can actually, you know, see some of these scans um, so I'm, I'm trying to give you an example if there's an area that you guys are interested in looking at, but, um, you know, we have, you know, as you mentioned, Fort Lauderdale is a little bit more difficult, um, you know, in, in figuring out, um, online, uh, I would say to figuring out what you can find, but you can get into here and see, um, let's just give you an example. This is D5. Um, you know, described as characterized by detrimental influences. It's um, not showing up on mine. Can you see it? No, it's still showing my, the image of my piece. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Do you, how does it look for you, Emmanuel? 
Um, I was just seeing your piece as well. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting me know. All right. So how about? Yep. That's join now. Yep. Okay. On now. Okay, great. So let's move this over here. So yeah, so this is super interesting, the way looking at your piece and then looking back at this map, you know, looking at all of these different areas that are marked hazardous or, you know, green for best, and then you can dip kind of into it and they have, um, these universities have scanned all the, uh, all of the information. So this is all information from 1935 to 1940. Um, you know, where you get detrimental influences, lack of adequate building restrictions, variety and type of construction and design. Um, so it, it's just a very interesting history to look at because you can see, you know, certain areas were designated um, for black communities. Um, you know, looking at, uh, I can show this uh, Roots of Liberia, you know, where you're looking at, um, Hollywood in particular. You know, how Hollywood was built, um, designed by Joseph Young, who they just showed, and then they designated Liberia and then brought in, um, you know, had all of these uh, different people coming in from outside communities from the South, Black South, um, and there they showed very quickly with the islands, um, you know, people coming in and living in these communities. And then these, the red lining starts showing up by the 30s, um, you know, that I, that I just think is so profoundly interesting in, in how these areas were created and how these areas have now shifted. I would love for either of you to speak a little bit about that because um, it also leans in a lot to what Emmanuel is saying. Um, just, you know, things that you've noticed or changed or, you know, from the research that you've seen, you know, a lot of these areas, because we can click and look, this is bestneighborhood.org, uh, you know, looking at these different neighborhoods. Um, and how it's, yeah, go ahead, Emmanuel. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was going to let uh, <laughs> Miss Adrian go first. Um, but uh, um, just re repeating what you're saying, just finding out like like about the changes that we've experienced um, in our time here, like on a local mm -hmm. level. Um, I mean, me personally, just on like, you know, um, being raised in Hollywood, I've been here most of my life since 2002. So um, a lot of it, like a lot of changes for me was just seeing like some of the the places we used to go to um, now being tore down and being um, impacted by gentrification on a larger level. I remember um, when I was going to South Broward High School, one of the places we used to always go to a lot was Lincoln Park on Lincoln and 24th. And it used to be, um, you know, a, a basketball court, a baseball field, a football field, um, a little play area, and, you know, like a, like a trail for you to be able to like, you know, take a walk, you know, like a walk around the park. And it used to be one of the, 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 the social epicenters for a lot of us teenagers growing up. And then um, recently, um, maybe about 11 years ago or 12 years ago, they um, built a, a school over it, a Montessori, Mon I, don't, I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, sorry for butchering it, but like a Montessori school. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, so that was one of the experiences, um, things that, that um, you know, witness changing as well as a lot of the infrastructure, some of the stores we used to go to. Smith's store was um, was one that was recently tore down a couple of years ago in the city of Dania Beach. And, you know, it was really tragic because, you know, Mr. Smith was a pioneer um, in the community, entrepreneur in the community. And he used to be one of the places where like kids from addicts, um, when it was a high school, they were able to go there, you know, get their snacks and, you know, little things like that, um, you know, before school or during um, lunch break during school, because during that, those times, um, high school students were able to um, leave off campus to go um, for lunch. And then, you know, seeing it being tore down and it's just like an empty field now. And um, that there's talks of like, um, um, like, like apartments being built there. And it's like, you know, is this, are these even gonna be affordable to the, you know, the folks that live in this community? 
as well as just like, you know, we, I believe in revitalization where a, a infrastructure, like an infrastructure like Smith store could have been something beneficial to the community. It could have been a community center of some sort for the, for the, for the community or like a mental health um, institution or something that's just going to benefit those that live there. So just on um, my time um, in Broward, starting to just continuously see the changes. And even a recent one is, you know, Daniel Point, we you know with, um, used to be boomers. It used to be Grand Prix Racerama when I was um, growing up. So yeah, the changes are really evident. And, you know, to me, it's very blatant. And it seems like it's, it's so striking. Um, and, and you, on one hand, you see things evolving slowly, right? You're like, oh, it's your lifetime kind of seeing it change. And then on another hand, you see it like a, a flip of a switch. You see some of these buildings come in and uh, you know, I was listening to NPR the other day and they said Hialeah apartments were going up 65% in rent, um, which is, that's insanely drastic. So in so many ways, it's like, you, you can kind of see things slowly happening. And then all of a sudden there's a tower or there's development or there's these new condominiums that are, that are um, forcing people, um, they have to raise their rents. Mm -hmm. the, and drastic so, it's crazy so for me um as an artist that has in the last year and a half been working at opalaka community development corporation which is a 41 year old organization that works with um kind of developing the community and building affordable housing complexes well it's kind of it's very interesting because after working at museums for 27 years and now working in a kind of a different environment it's really teaching me a lot about the city planning process and it's just kind of making me more aware um, both from my artwork and just from my own um, knowledge of my community and what what I'm learning is that these decisions that are being made on on what Emmanuel was talking about like knocking things down or building new new types of buildings it, it happens like 20 years, 15 years, 10 years prior with decisions, with uh, zoning laws and decisions that are made. And it doesn't necessarily take shape. Like by the time I'm aware of it, it's like, oh, it just happened. They made a decision and it happened, but it's really been going into effect through, through policy and through change years in advance. Like for instance, we're here in Hollywood. I live here and Art and Culture Center Hollywood is right here near Young Circle. And I just read an article that said that 15 years ago, right after or right before the Great Recession, Hollywood changed their zoning laws from, from, um, be, uh, from developers being allowed to build a building that was like, I think, under 100 feet to over like 250 feet. They changed that 15 years ago. But then the Great Recession happened and all these things happened and then COVID happened and all these things happened. So nothing happened. No, no developers decided, oh, I'm gonna build, build, a, a, build a huge skyscraping building. But now that the economy is changing and there's all these plans now, like the bread building just came down. They purchased that five or, or so years ago, um, but the zoning laws changed 15 years ago and now in the next five years, we're going to see three to five new, um, like 300 unit apartment buildings or buildings being built right here in Young Circle. But it's just so interesting how that that process started so long ago. The other thing that's interesting that I read in that article is about uh, the transportation. Like there's going to be where the old Publix is, that, that complex is going to be knocked down and two twin buildings are going to be built in that space. And they've been also working for five years to change the, the street instead of um, Hollywood Boulevard right now goes from the circle and then you go around the public's building to the beach. But they're changing the zoning so that that street goes straight from the circle right through to the beach. And it's just interesting how, how long these processes are. So if we community members or marginalized community members are not aware of how long these processes take and when to be involved, we're gonna continue this cycle. Like, and it's so interesting, you have this map on the, on the page right now on the, on the presenting yeah. it. That map 
looks almost like those redlining maps from the 1930s and, and 40s. And unless like when we own homes, when there's a decision that's gonna be made, they, they send out a letter to you every time there's gonna be a building that gets knocked down. They send out a letter for you to show up to a meeting, to have a decision, to be part of the community action that is making the decisions. And what they do is they just have these meetings and nobody shows up and nobody's giving a voice and nobody's advocating. So we're, we're seeing the back end, but we're not getting in front of it in order to have feedback and to, to make a difference. And in Opalaka, yeah. that's what OLCDC is trying to do. They're trying to make a community that's desirable, but also fair as far as having enough housing for workforce, workforce housing, but also like, you know, different levels of housing. And some of those buildings that they're building in Young Circle, I noticed that 25% of the units are gonna be work, considered workforce housing, which means that they're like kind of like rent control. The, and, and it would be for people who make at least half of the median income for the county. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, it's gonna be like 500 to $800 cheaper than the going rate for apartments. So that's what we need. We need fair policies yeah. in place yeah. within the same building. You don't want yeah. to make a, a ghetto by grouping a whole bunch of people who all make the same amount of money or the same race or the same gender or the same you know, sexual identity all together. We want to have like an interesting dynamic um, loom of, of neighborhoods and people. Uh, and so I think that hopefully the policies that they're putting in place now are fair. And the, and the developers are able to benefit from this. So why shouldn't they? You know, there's all sorts of incentives that they get for doing things like that, right? So I think it's it's definitely an interesting conversation. They're just not going to do it unless they have to, or they're told to, or they, you know, they, you know, it's like they're looking for the deal that'll work, but you know, it really does take community activism, you know, in order to say, hey. We're cool with this, but you need to do this. You need to make sure that those apartments are allotted because in, in talking to our representatives about it, I guess. I want to make sure because both of you do work that, you know, has so much to do with activism. Um, and in Emmanuel's work has so much to do with history and archiving history, because as Adrian, you just mentioned, like looking at this map, there's not a huge difference in a comparison of maps when you're looking at um, the way that Miami is now, the way that, that it was redlined in 1935, and the way that these houses are priced, and the way that the demographics are kind of listed. Um, you know, just the, I mean, I mean I, even just saying these clarifying remarks and the inhabitants and the way that it's spoken about, I don't think that there is a lot that has changed here. Um, but so one of the things that I would love to speak with Emmanuel about is, um, so in speaking about, this is a quick uh, excerpt from the video that we have on exhibition. I wanna show this real quick. I don't think that it's gonna be the same. Uh, I think that most of the black areas are going to be gentrified out where they want to bring more affluent people into the lesser um, populated areas that have more money to be able to help to fund the city. Um, I don't know, it, it's a sad state of affairs to me because I just think that all of our black populated areas are being gentrified out at the hands of our um, Leaders. The future, I don't really see it being black. I see it being diverse and it's more, I mean, the, it seems like what they're doing is they're dressing up the outside of all of these neighborhoods. Sis, Trump, Hallandale, Daniel, they dressing up the outside and all of the people are behind the walls. They're behind the scenes. So you don't really see them. Like if you ride through that neighborhood, you would think it's this thriving neighborhood, especially if you've never been there before. Even guys that are getting out of prison, when they come to this neighborhood, they're going to be lost as well. They're going to be like, this isn't the neighborhood that they grew up in. I see it expanding, expanding rapidly too, you know. I mean, this is a great example of something that you're you're seeing right here. Emmanuel, perhaps you can speak about um, 
how these stories um, unfolded. What what prompted your desire to get these these stories, this narrative, um, and and how it kind of um, how it kind of evolved and came together, especially with regards to the work you're doing now. Um, I I give so much thanks to uh, my father uh, for mobilizing me to appreciate and love Black history, and to Dr. Kitty Oliver for believing in me and pushing me to, uh, you know, be more proactive with my work. And yeah, that's what basically got it started. Um, it, it's been like something where it's almost like an obsession for me uh, to continue to find out as much information about history, about Black history, but most importantly, Black history in our own backyards. Um, you know, history is very like almost uh, erased um, especially when it comes to Black history. So imagine how much history in our own backyard that we don't really know about. So that was what really pushed me to it. And as well as um, in light of what's happening now with so much gentrification that's happening, it's a must to be able to document and preserve because if you don't, there's no telling what can be done. Anyone can be able to tell your story because you didn't tell it, you didn't document it. So that was what really uh, pushed me to be able to do this work and using art as a medium to be able to broadcast this work, whether it's through film, documentary, storytelling, or through pop-ups and through art exhibitions, because we have to find creative ways to educate people as opposed to just a typical, you know, classroom board lecture, you know? We have to find cool ways to be able to get um, people interested as well as our younger generation. Um, I'd love for you to speak about the project that you're doing now. Um, and let me just pull this up um, because it, it, this is, how long did you mention? It was almost 10 years that you've been working on this project. Well, yeah, um, it's, um, it's well, not, 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 not 10 years. Um, um, it's been about oh. like five or six. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, know, okay. I started yeah. really around 2015, 2016. So about, yeah, seven, six, seven years. Um, I've been really passionate about um, South Broward's Black history. That's where I'm from. I graduated from South Broward High School, went there all four years. Been living in Hollywood since 2002. So growing up, a lot of my friends were in the Liberia area. We're in the Hallandale, the Northwest Hallandale area. We're in the Carver Ranches area. We're in the, the Northwest Dania Beach, otherwise known as Dany area. And for the most part, as a teenager growing up, it was always like, okay, these areas are the trap. They're the hood. You know, it's like, you know, there's not much there. And then until uh, Kitty Oliver was teaching me about the history of South Broward with Addicts High School, Addicts being the, the social, uh, well, the, the more sort of educational epicenter of South Broward. There was community meetings at Addicts. There was a lot of um, history clubs at Addicts. Uh, teenagers, Black teenagers were able to get their driver's license at Addicts. Um, you know, so we think about today, like, you know, we have to go in line at a long DMV to you know, get our license or our permits, you know, now, you know, but back then they were able to do that at, at, at the high school. They were having trades and skill sets, being mechanics at high schools, um, history clubs, all kind of things like that. And there was really a, a determination about education and being able to prosper. And they were doing this off of hand-me-down books from South Broward High School in Hollywood Hills. So, um, you know, it, it's just a, a, a testament to the greatness. And when, when I was able to hear about that, as well as other stories like the Palms Nightclub in Hallandale where James Brown and Sam Cooke and many other legends, Aretha Franklin would go to. So it really uh, inspired me to wanna to be able to search more um, and then finding out like there, these were black Wall Streets in our communities, in, in Liberia, in Hallandale, in Dania Beach. And you know, so being, for me to be able to find this was just like very fascinating. And it just really wanted me to, I just wanted to be able to document and be able to make sure that this story is preserved. It was such a fascinating story, but it's like even people my generation didn't really know about it. So I just, I just really took the initiative to be able to do my part and being able to, to talk to the elders and you know hit that record button and make sure that their voices um, will last beyond our lifetime. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things you mentioned that really struck me that makes sense is that, that you know probably you know students weren't expected to go to college. And so that's probably a main reason why they were like, we need to set these kids up to get out there to make sure that they have some sort of trade, um, that they took the initiative to really prepare them for the world. The reality of the world um, seems so striking. Um, are there some, can you tell us about some of the conversations? Like, are there some things that kind of really struck you? I mean, 
it, and also for it to suddenly shut down in like 68, I think is really interesting too. You said that, uh, you know, as we were talking earlier that it went class by class that they started bringing, uh, they stopped the freshman class then and kind of filtered it out, right? Maybe you could speak a little bit more about yeah. it. So um, some of the, the fascinating stories is just like he, knowing that like you had so many um, great people that came from addicts. Um, Cyril Pender, um, a, a Bahamian that came from addicts. He was um, their greatest athlete. He ended up playing for the Chicago Bears and the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and he was not just only a talented athlete, but he was extremely intelligent and he was extremely talented. And one of the stories I used to hear about um, um, Cyril Pender, and he passed away actually um, last year, and um, he graduated, uh, I believe, class of 64. Uh, one of the fascinating things was um, he would dominate on the football field, and during halftime, he would then dress up and perform in the band. And then after the halftime, he would dress back up and go back on the field and dominate. Um, you know, you had many people like Bobby Grace who went to Addicts, and she was the, the second Black elected official in Broward County history. You had um, Al Jones who went to Addicts. You had Milton Jones who owns Regal Trace on Sistrunk and owns um, property on, owns that, that land on the Save-A-Lot Plaza on Sistrunk. He went to Addicts. You had um, Boise Waiters, the first black elected official in Broward County history was at Lanier Junior High, which was the buffer school for Addicts. Um, you also had uh, Margaret Blake Roach um, who was the Dean of Girls at Addicts. You had Kathleen Cooper Wright's husband, I forgot his name, um, but he was um, an, um, a staff um, member at Addicts. You also had um, um, Eric Jones, Senator Chevron Jones' father that went to Addicts class of 65. So it wasn't just athletes, um, but mm -hmm. when we hear about like black high school, it's always about athletes, you know, like you had many intelligent people that was coming from this school and they were doing this off of hand-me-down books and hand-me-down resources. So that was always fascinating. And then when the school closed in 1968 was a huge impact, not just on the community of Liberia, but the greater South Broward County in the sense that, you know, once the school closed, now you had um, a community of different folks coming to Attics. You had Carver Ranches, you had Northwest Hallandale, you had Liberia, you had Dany, which is Northwest Dania Beach. You also had a section in Davie called Alpine, which is a small community where black folks live. And you also had an area called Oges, which is now Aventura, which was um, a community of black folks that lived in Oges, which is where we know Aventura, which is, you know, upscale multi-million dollar condos and things like that. They went to Attics. So it, the, the, the community fragmented. And then you had like um, students now, they had to go to MacArthur High School. They had to go to Miramar High School. They had to go to Hallandale High School. They had to go to Cooper City High School. They had to go to South Broward High School. And South Broward and MacArthur were schools that was there um, pre-integration. But Hallandale opened up in 1973, right in the black community. So there was no need for um, the kids to, to really want to fight. It's built a high school in our community. Cooper City was uh, established in 1970. Um, you know, and then um, Miramar was opened in 1970. Uh, so you had these schools that was like being built and then now it's like, we're going to disperse them there. But even prior to that, um, in Addicts High School, they were already starting to like, you know, extract some of the best athletes from our school and some of our most gifted students to start integrating. So they were taking our creme de la creme, which to me was like kind of like by design to get our best students to slowly um, kill off the school. And, um, you know, according to many of the elders there that went to Addicts, what, um, when they were talking about the time that the school closed was there was a lot of underhanded meetings at the time and there was not rep much representation in high places to, to protect the school. Um, Hollywood didn't even have an elected official until recently, a black elected official. I mean, you know, Miss Linda Anderson and there was not any black people on the school board until Kathleen Cooper Wright, um, you know, God bless her soul, um, was the first black woman to serve on the, Broward, um, on, a, on a school board, not just in Broward County, but in the state of Florida. So, um, you know, we didn't have much representation, so it was easy for us to be wiped away. But the interesting aspect as well that I do want to add is that the closing of Attics inadvertently saved Blanche Ely High School from closing, and it sa inadvertently saved Dillard High School from closing because there was a concentrated effort to close down these schools. Blanche Ely High School closed in 1970, and when, when the school closed in 1970, 
Miss Ely was in um, her high school all the time, gathering all the documents and information, which is what we see now at the Blanche Ely Museum across the street, because her husband was the principal at Attucks High School. So there was a connection. Miss Professor Ely was married to Miss Blanche Ely. And he did retire a couple of years prior to the school closing, but he still had strong ties because he was the principal there for 33 years from 1930 to 1963. So, um, you know, that inadvertently when that when she seen what happened to her husband's school, she started documenting and saving. And that's when that's what saved Ely. And then there was a, a, an, a, an, a, an attack on closing Dillard. But Dillard has such a strong, powerful community in Fort Lauderdale that that did not happen. So inadvertently, Attucks was in a way like a sacrifice that saved these two other black high schools in Broward, these two other historical black high schools in Broward County. That's, that's incredible. Um, just really fascinating history. And I think the other thing that, you know, was really interesting as you were saying earlier is like, you know, I think foolishly, there's a bit of like this idea of integration being this kind of rosy picture, but it's fraught and it's complicated. Very and so when you see this integration of, you know, we're, you know, addicts is closed down and all the beautiful things that were about addicts went with it. As you had mentioned, like the, the teachers lost their jobs. They didn't get a few of them got rehired. And when they did, it was a totally different position mm -hmm. at another school. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things about the Brown versus Board of Education, um, it is great in, um, you know, in theory, you know, it is great for black students and white students to go to school together you know, to learn together, to grow together. But also um, one of the, the aspects is, you know, um, it was according to a recent study, uh, I have to find the source for this, but um, throughout the South, um, over 240 black um, high school teachers lost their, their jobs when integration happened. And many of them, you know, the students were impacted by this because there was no longer really teachers that looked like them. Uh, many of the teachers that were able to keep their job where it had to, you know, get something that was completely off base with their field. So if you were a phenomenal social studies teacher at Attucks, you might be, um, you know, a, a custodian or a, a janitor or, uh, you know, like something like a, like a physical education teacher, which is nothing wrong with being a physical education teacher, but that wasn't, that's not your drive, but it was things like that. So it was, um, you know, ways of pushing um, folks to just really just, you know, not be comfortable and to, want to um you know quit and move on and then um the second question that you asked um was also um I, i'm sorry um we will repeat the second question <laughs> i kind of got too caught up in the first one i got too caught up as well okay but i'm I think, sorry so yeah it, it, it was okay it's like it makes me think of like so kitty wrote this one book i meant to show the pictures but i do have the uh, kitty oliver's race and change book where she's talking about greg samuel yes you know, was mm -hmm. one of the first three kids that ended up, ended up at South Broward. Um, I believe it was because he left Attucks because he wanted to learn German. I'm, I'm not 100% yes. clear. I mm -hmm. think that's why he left. But he was one of three and the bullying was so intense that like the later that day he went back to Attucks because it was just, you know, wanting to go back. But then how he kind of persevered with it because this was normal mm -hmm. for these three kids you know they're in high school they're kids um to be going through such an incredibly tumultuous moment um and then graduating um it's it's a very interesting story to me and then he ended up becoming i think a gym teacher or something in the mm -hmm. end like he ended up teaching back in high schools yeah um, it was him they're... and um andy warner um his nickname was foots um and interesting that when they went to south broward that was actually the first time that Broward, that South Broward actually went to a state championship when, you know, these, these few black men ended up going to the school. That was when they went to a state championship. And Rodney Collins, graduated, a graduate of class of 67 at Attucks, was speaking about this in the documentary, interesting enough, about these two. Um, and he was just like, oh, you wow. know, imagine if they were to do this at our school at Attucks. And another interesting tidbit is, um, you know, economics is is um, a huge part because Dillard and Ely, they're able to use their alumni influence with their money. 
So when Dillard needs something like, oh, you know, we might need some resource or something, they'll call up their alumni associates. We're going to call a class of 73. We're going to call a class of 65. And then, you know, some computers is coming in or some um, helmet equipment or tech equipment is coming to Dillard. Same thing with Ely. And, you know, when they closed Attics, we were not able to have that generational wealth because the last class was 68. So um, it's really important right now to be able to, for me, um, and one of my missions is to be able to use this film as a way to connect generations. Um, those that are a part of the Addicts Alumni Association, as well as a lot of the high schools like South Broward, Hallandale, and um, um, Hollywood Hills, McFadder, they have BSUs. So it's, it's important to be able to connect um, the BSUs with the Addicts Alumni Association because that way it's bringing things back full circle because you know that was where um, folks had to go to was South Broward and Hollywood Hills and these schools. So it's really important to connect um, the two so that um, addicts can remain um, you know, after the alumni leave because 68 was the last graduating class. So that means the youngest people there that went to addicts is either 71 turning 72 or 72, the youngest. So you know, it's really important to be able to connect right now so that whether they're the heirs of addicts or the grandchildren of addicts, whatever name it is or term comes, but to be able to connect the two so that, um, you know, after, you know, they're long gone, the history and the story remains. So the, the plan is with this documentary, which I think is remarkable, is that um, you're finishing it up now. Um, yeah. It's in the final editing, like you're literally going to get off of this and literally and, after this and I'm going yeah. <laughs> uh, so that you can um, get it get it completed so that you can start screening it in these high schools so that people can see directly um, what is happening which I think is fantastic um, it's something mm -hmm. that you know we were thinking about with the exhibition here we wanted to have some South Broward yearbooks in here because we have students that come through here we mm -hmm. have a lot of uh, kids that are coming through him here. So we want them to like really connect on that level. And I think that that's what your video will do. Yeah, um, I, would, I would love to, you know, even showcase the film at the cultural center, maybe for Black History Month on, the, on a certain day. Um, you know, right now, I mean, we do have- honored. A, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we do have a screening um, at South Broward High School on the 25th, you know, with the, the BSU students, with the Addicts Alumni Association, their African-American history class and their film students. Um, and I am currently um, in works of a film screening in Fort Lauderdale. And um, yeah, that's the goal with this film. And, and the main goal is to have this at the Attics Auditorium, which seats 300 people. And historically, the Attics Auditorium is one of three remaining infrastructures of the original Attics High School. You have um, Earl Coach Bubba, Bubba Washington Gymnasium. He passed away last year. Um, that was one of the original pieces. The cafeteria was one of the original pieces and the auditorium. Oh, wow. So to have um, the film screening there is gonna be an absolute honor um, in that auditorium. And I'm working on that right now um, as well. So um, yeah, there's go there will be um, future screenings for this film. And um, another thing that I'm working with the uh, Addicts Middle School, because they do have a new principal there, is um, similar to when I was in high school in, in like the, the mid to late 2000s, um, folks that I knew at um, Ely and Pompano, it was a requirement for the ninth graders to have to go across the street to Miss Ely's house. It was a requirement for them to go. If you're going to Ely High School, you have to go to Miss Ely's house to get that feeling and to know about the importance of this school. So one of the things that, I'm, uh, that I did propose and it's in the works is for the Addicts documentary to be a requirement for the sixth graders to come in that's coming into Addicts Middle School to learn about Crispus Attics as well as the rich history of the land that they're on and the school that they're in. And you're also working to, you know, cause this is archiving, this is the importance of archiving that, you know, you have some of these like the Attics uh, High School Yearbook I know is at the uh, African-American Research Library and Cultural Center. Um, and then also, you know, I think it's amazing that you're working on Mars with the Hollywood Historical Society, if you want to speak a little bit about what you're doing there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, um, a big thanks to um, Ms. Grisby, um, you know, class of 67. She had like a duffel bag of every Addicts High School yearbook, except for their first graduating class of 1952, the class of 55, and I believe it was 56 or 57. So um, all of these um, yearbooks have been officially digitized 
um, at the African American Research Library and will be available for public view in about three to five months. African American Research Library is celebrating its 20 year anniversary in October. So there's a lot of great things happening there and having one of, having my collections to be a part of that this fall is gonna be is an absolute honor. And with the Hollywood Historical Society, um, oh, there is gonna be a virtual film screening with the Hollywood Historical Society on February 13th. Um, um, but as well as well with Clive Taylor, a good friend of mine, a, a, a phenomenal historian in Hollywood as well. Um, we're working on bringing two historical um, plaques, those like history um, landmark plaques that you usually see in areas. And two of them will be coming to Liberia. One will be coming on 22nd Avenue, which was, which was the historic black business district in Liberia, um, home of Tony's Bar. Um, you had a barber shops, you had um, restaurants, and even across the street, you had the Paradise Club where James Brown used to um, perform at. And, um, you know, you had on Cody Street, which is where the other plaque is, which was Cody Street was like the who's who of Liberia. You had um, one of the prime ministers of the Bahamas that used to come and stay on Cody Street. His last name was Bain. Um, you had, um, um, oh my goodness, the, it, was a, it was a gospel group um, that used to be there. Um, James Brown actually had blood relatives in Liberia. His aunt stayed in Liberia on Cody Street I believe, um, that she stayed on. And he also had the Evans family who he was related to that stayed on Raleigh Street. So you also had the who's who. Cyril Pender um, stayed on Cody Street. You had a lot of legendary people. I'm, um, there, one of the churches there on Cody Street was where Sam Cooke, when he was with the, um, what was the group? The, the Stirs, I believe, was when he was doing gospel music. Um, they were, that's where he used to frequent as well. So um, there's going to be two um, um, plaques there. And then even also talks of like some, some plaques at some of the historic landmarks in Attic's middle school. Um, like the gymnasium and the auditorium and the cafeteria. And truly the way that you're finding this out is through storytelling, is through talking with these people before, you know, memory loss and before it's yeah. too late. I mean, that's yeah. what's so beautiful about this. Yeah, because when you, when you, the more you talk to the elders, you start to see like, okay, like 20 people just said the same thing, you know, so then you start to find truth. And that's the power in oral history because it's a means of gathering data um, around a, a central purpose or a theme. So once you're able to, to like gather this information, you're starting to see, okay, 20 people all said this about someone. 10 people all said this. Mm -hmm. So there is starting to see some truth. Now you will come across this couple instances where, you know, something just sounds so far off and you've never heard it from someone else. But you know, the, that's the beauty in oral history. And it's something that I really encourage many folks to get into, especially with what's happening in this state of Florida with you know, wanting to, um, you know, ban, you know, teachings of, of black history, which is insane, you know, so we really got to be able to mobilize people to do this work, because all oral history is a means of gathering data, and we need to preserve what's, um, you know, what's left, you know, so because since they're trying to erase it, okay, y'all want to erase it and not talk about it, we'll preserve it so that it's still accessible for people to see and learn. It's it's a it's interesting too in that it's a long history in trying to erase history, and so these are two books I wanted to quickly point out that Adrian had recommended. One of the things that I that we had spoken with the um, artist was to give us a resource list of recommendations of things that inspired them, and so Adrian had recommended these two books, and and this one I've been really interested in because it tells the history of erasing history and how, you know, this kind of conversation that we're seeing now with, with erasing um, critical discourse um, and race theory, it, it, it's been going on for some time. And it's like over and over and over again. This was the other book, um, Real Estate and the Remaking of Jim Crow South Florida. Um, and so I do want to welcome, um, invite people to go to our website to see Emmanuel recommended this incredible documentary that we have listed on our resource list, all of the different things that, um, you know, have, that are really very helpful to many of the different artists, um, and that I personally have really appreciated and have found incredibly enlightening as well. So, um, we're coming up to the end of things, um, I knew this was going to go by fast. I knew that you both are, I just love talking to both of you and I wanted, and I was very much excited to do this. So I thank you both for taking the time to have this conversation. 
Um, thank you, Megan. It's, it's, thank every, you. every part of this exhibit has been amazing and all the programming that you're doing. Um, I'm very proud to be part of this amazing show with all these, you know, artists and um, thank you. Truly, I hope, yeah. So to, to people um, that haven't been here, please come. Um, yeah, all credits and love to Marie Vickles for curating uh, such a beautiful show and, and being such a delight to work with. Um, we would love for you all to come. If you have any comments, um, questions, anything that you would like to send our way because we didn't have enough time, um, just drop me an email, put it on the Facebook, you know, in this event, you can put some questions up and we can go back and look at it. You can drop me an email, you can give me a phone call. Um, we really want to welcome uh, this conversation and keep it going. So again, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> thank Bye -bye. you, Megan. Well, appreciate you. Bye. Appreciate you. Bye. Bye.